The Czechs have a long and storied cinema history, and obviously Prague being the capital, that's where a lot of the movies get made. We have Barandov, lots and lots of movies are shot here. So film is clearly an important part of the cultural landscape of the Czechs and of the city. To talk about this with me today is film journalist and blogger Ryan Keating Lambert? Is that right? Is that a hyphenated last name? Yes, yeah, it is. Well, it's it's right and it's wrong. Ooh, that sounds like a story. I like that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, his blog, Movie Barf, which is a great name, and uh, about the Czech film industry and film here in Prague. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. Okay, Ryan Keating Lambert, what's with the name? So, uh, well, my name is just Ryan Keating, but my mother's maiden name was Lambert, and I've always really liked this name. I don't know why, I just think it sounds nice and I've always loved my mum's side of the family. Obviously my grandmother was, and my grandfather were kind of heroes of mine. Uh, my grandfather was a journalist, a very mm. good human rights journalist. I really loved him so I kind of just put it there on Facebook just to not have my name, I guess, my normal name on Facebook. And then it stuck and <laughs> I didn't really think about it because I mean, everyone in Australia, and before living in Prague, I lived in London, so everyone knew what my real name was, so they knew that, it, you know, it was bullshit. But then, when I was new to Prague, no, no one knew that, so everyone was adding me on Facebook, and that was the time when you added everyone on Facebook and met them there. So yeah, it stuck. And now, it, with the cinema stuff, for example, anytime I go to a festival, sometimes I need to tell them if it's a really official festival, like Kala Vivari, no, don't put Lambert there, just because just you kidding. see it. Yeah, just, just kidding. Just kidding, but... Yeah. Fun. Yeah, but but I like it. I mean, why not have two last names? It sounds very sophisticated, I'd <laughs> say. Yeah. Now, speaking of names, so your blog is called Movie Barf, mm-hmm. and I got to ask about that name. Why that name? I love it, but why that name? Uh, so... I was trying to think of something that was a kind of pun at the time. It was, the year was 2015. And uh, I knew that I wanted to make a blog about film. And a lot of, not a lot of people, but a few people have told me that when I start to talk about film, especially when I've been drinking, I talk about it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, to the point where it's just like, verbal diarrhea or vomit Ah. and you know i didn't want to call it movie diarrhea because that would be gross and weird and also it doesn't (laughs) that logo i just don't know what that would have been (laughs) also it doesn't really rhyme with anything so um yeah so i came up with movie barf but i i'm still not i'm really happy that you like it because i'm still not really sure if it works at the time i thought i'm genius it's great it's really good and this logo will be really funny i also love the logo (laughs) yeah my my friend mirak motz did that logo who was an amazing illustrator by the way i have to say thank you to him yeah i mean because in australia we would say um movie buff Barf, and and yeah. also, we don't we don't say barf. We would say we wouldn't say barf at all. We would say like vomit, chanda, spew, something right. like that for vomit. Te- the Technicolor yawn. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so uh, so it was kind of an odd choice, and I'm I'm not sure if it works. But if people get it, then that's great. I'm happy. I think it's too late because you've accidentally ended up uh, building a brand for yourself, it seems. I mean, you're now, you started off doing the blog, then I noticed that you started doing some small events, and then you started partnering with Edison Film Hub, which is itself a rather new thing on the Prague cinema scene. And now you're doing these movie barf Mondays where you guys have like, what do you do, a film, and then a discussion afterwards. Is the discussion always in English or no? It is, yeah. It's always Uh, in English because my check is terrible. 
For my defense, I understand a lot. Right. I just can't speak it very Passive well. Passive knowledge is useful. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us about these uh, these these uh, things at Edison Film Hub. How did you get them to agree? They seem like they should be cool. So are they? Yeah, they are very, very cool. Um, I'm really, really happy to be at Edison. Uh, there, we have a bit of a history, actually. Mm-hmm. So Edison uh, just celebrated their one-year anniversary. Mm-hmm. So they're still very, very new, as you said. But they're owned by Film Europe. Mm-hmm. So they're a distributor for the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And they buy and distribute films from big A-list film festivals like Cannes, Berlinale, Venice. And they basically put them in cinemas on the Czech market so they and Slovak market and they always wanted to have their own cinema to screen a lot of their films uh, which they finally did uh, and I asked them hey, I kind of done a little bit of work before that in other cinemas in Prague doing film nights here and there but then I asked them oh would you like to do a regular slot because they've always supported me from day one my blog has been around for almost four years and in the beginning when I had absolute no idea what I was doing. Not that I have any idea what I'm doing now. <laughs> Slightly more, like 10% more. Four years experience worth. <laughs> yeah, a bit more. Uh, but still not perfect. But anyway, they, they were very supportive from the very beginning. They invited mm-hmm. me to festivals and I learned a lot through them and they were fantastic. So when I asked them, they said, of course, let's meet and talk about it. Uh, in the beginning, we were just showing a few of their films just trying to kind of work out the program, what people wanted, trying to find the audience. A lot of the films that uh, we screen, I choose myself. I try to have as diverse a program as possible, just because everyone's kind of different, but obviously I love a good art house film. I love a good horror film. So there's a lot of that stuff in there as well. So yeah. yeah, I mean, Edison Film Hub is new, and they opened up just over by the Jubilee Synagogue. And there are a bunch of these new places in town. There's the, is the Kino na Loj? Is that still happening? Do you know? That's a good question. I'm not sure, but yeah. I don't yeah. know if they got knocked out from COVID. This is a cinema on a boat, if you can imagine this, inside of like a covered boat mm-hmm. sort of a space. There's Screenshot. Screenshot is great. I recommend people go there. It's a really interesting space and a really cool bar as well. And of course, we have Pan Repo. Pan Repo mm-hmm. has been the, oh, actually the National Film Archives screening room and cinema for ages and ages and ages. Mm-hmm. There used to be these things called Kino Cavarnas, which I think are almost gone out. It literally translates as like cinema cafe. And it was a place where you could go and watch the movie. It was normal price. And they also served food and drink and you could smoke, and that was it, basically. About halfway through the film, they would rather arbitrarily create an intermission, and now they're almost all gone, Mm. you know? Now they're starting to bring them back, kind of, sort of, but like a high-end version. Yeah, that's true, yeah. They're calling them boutique cinemas, which... Edison is one of them, and the the other one is Pritomnost, and there are others too. So, and I know, uh, I think it's the Andiel place, Sinistar, that also, like, they have a, for quite a bit more money, they do this thing, but they're trying to do this high-end version of, like, and you get a nice wine and all. I'm like, I don't want to drink a wine while I'm watching Mm. a Star Trek movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to eat a hot dog and have a beer. Exactly, yeah. And popcorn. Yeah, Mm -hmm. can we talk about popcorn for a minute? Because... Yes, let's, because the Czech popcorn scene in the cinemas is um, borderline dire. (laughs) It's not that they don't like it. They get offended when you talk about popcorn in cinemas, especially in the independent cinemas, not mentioning any names. (laughs) But (laughs) in some of them, if you ask them if they have popcorn, they get very, very angry. And they say, you know, it ruins the movie. It's too Western. And I think that depends entirely on what kind of movie you're going to see. I mean, I can personally eat popcorn through any movie, but it's essential. Come on. It's, It's part of the culture it's the smell of it everything i i have to have one because obviously we have the multiplexes and uh and slovansky doom which is right downtown oddly mm-hmm. enough every once in a while like they'll show a film with subtitles that elsewhere is dubbed because mm-hmm. the checks will the checks generally subtitle foreign films but they will dub anything that they imagine is going to be attractive to children. Mm -hmm, So like, hey, the new Shrek film comes out, it's going to be dubbed. But Slavonsky Doom might have a subtitle version. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's kind of cool that 
check subtitle. What's, mm. what's your opinion on subtitling and dubbing? I am a huge supporter of subtitles. I think they're the best, not just for understanding what's going on in the film, but I think for learning language, for children, they're just fantastic. I mean, I understand that for kids, dubbing is essential. For sure. For, yeah, they're not going to read that fast. No, yeah. for these Pixar films and stuff like that. But I love that Slavonsky do them do this because every now and then I want to go and see a Pixar film. Some of them are really yeah. good yeah. and deserve the time of day. So I like that. But um, in saying that, yeah, no, I can't stand dubbing. And maybe that sounds bad because I don't come from, you know, I'm a, I'm a native English speaker. So right. it's it's a lot of work, you know, you for everyone else. You dog. Exactly. <laughs> It's a lot of work to learn English, but I have watched, it was in Australia years and years ago in Brisbane where I'm from, and with a friend, I wanted to show her Run Lola Run, which is amazing German film, German film yeah, by yeah. Tom Tequa. And she didn't have her glasses on her. So, and we were watching it on DVD, so she wanted me to put the dubbed version. And that was the first time I'd been exposed to dubbing, really. Oh, really? Coming from Australia, I'd, I'd never really heard it. If mm -hmm. there was something on the, on the, foreign film channel that would have subtitles yeah and i had it on and it was just these horrible horrible british dubbing over the top of german it just didn't work at all at <laughs> all and i said to her she said this is fine i said no this is anything but fine well you no certainly way. lose you lose the performance yeah absolutely so much so. speaking of australian films when mad max mm -hmm. first came out the very first mad max mm -hmm. film when they did test screenings, Americans couldn't understand the Australian <laughs> accents. So it was released in cinemas in the U.S. Mm -hmm. dubbed. This is before Mel Gibson. Dubbed. Oh my, dubbed. I, I thought you were going to say subtitles. No. Dubbed. Oh dubbed my gosh. with American accents. So now Mel Gibson's rather famous and infamous. Yeah. And very much so. Very much so. Yeah. But back in the day, like now he's a you know he became a big star. But back then he's got this voice like, mm. "Come on, guys, when are we gonna go for a ride?" <laughs> and you're like, "What the hell happened?" That's so weird. I'd actually really like to see that to, to screen that even. It's surreal. Yeah. Actually, you should. That's that would be really fun to screen. That would be awesome. You, well, you know, in <laughs> Germany, I used to live in Germany, and they do dubbing mm -hmm. almost exclusively. Yeah, I've heard very that. few cinemas where you can find subtitles mm -hmm. but they have so like they have an actor mm -hmm. who dubs everything bill murray does he's bill murray so people get used to that voice yeah. it's similar here too like the guy that mm -hmm. uh plays harry potter uh Wojciech, i also don't remember his name which is Wojciech. terrible he's a good friend Wojt we'll call him Wojciech. Wojta, my Wojta. pal Wojta, <laughs> aka harry potter uh, he's very famous for that. Everyone knows him as the guy that does Harry Potter. And he does all that. And when they hear Harry, Harry Potter's Potter. real voice by Daniel Radcliffe, they're weirded out because they're so used to the other version. And, and <laughs> some people even say, no, I prefer the dubbed version. Isn't and that funny? Sometimes they really prefer the dubbed versions. I know with Monty Python, they, <laughs> they really prefer the dubbed version, which for me is very odd because, I mean, Monty Python, a really huge part of that humor is that is their voice, their yeah. accent, their intonation, everything. They're, they're pausing, and I don't know how you can replicate that, but somehow mm -hmm. they did, so. I'm a huge Bugs Bunny fan. In fact, you could argue that he's my role model. And so when I first moved here, I was watching Czech television, and I said, oh, look, it's going to be Bugs Bunny, dubbed. And they had completely the wrong voice. Mm. Because he's a main character, now they've changed the way that they do things, but back then, because he's the main character, he has to have the main character guy do it. So he's talking like this. Mm -hmm. he says, and, and instead of, eh, what's up, Doc? They have the guy actually say, Yaksamata, Pana Doctor. <laughs> that does not work at all. I was like, what the hell? You've destroyed him! Yeah, and why would they make it so formal? Because why he's the main say, character. Uh, I know, Yaksamata. Yeah, that's right. Pana Doctor. <laughs> Pana Doctor. But by the way, the What's Up Doc, you did really well. You were Thank really you. convincing. I, I'm a huge Looney Tunes fan. It's what I grew up on as well. Mm. I loved Bugs Bunny, but I think my favorite was probably Sylvester. In Poland, under communism, they dubbed everything, but they had a guy. Yeah, who one did guy. All the voices, mm -hmm. male, female, children. So you have the same guy. And the thing is, he didn't even really make much of an effort. Yeah. So you'll have like the dialogue is like, you better watch your step or I'm going to shoot you in the mm. face. Go ahead and try, pal. Mm. No, don't.
shoot him. And it's the same guy just going, you better watch your step. I'm going to shoot you in the face. No, don't. Yeah, no, yeah. please don't shoot him. And they got rid of that guy. Mm. And people clamored to bring him back. <laughs> it's the it's the nostalgia thing. They Yeah, they miss it. But I think they still do that in some countries that I visited. Mm-hmm. I think they still have that one person that does everything. And you can hear they just turned down the original Exactly. Yeah, so you, they don't you can it. actually hear when I lived in Portugal, I met someone who claimed mm-hmm. she learned English from listening past the dubbing to the wow. low volume English in the background. That's, and that's where she learned English. That's skills. Wow. Clearly that's she's definitely. A yeah, yeah, I yeah. could not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Czech cinema, like so much of this country's cultural offerings, it has a disproportionate influence compared to, how, say, how tiny it is, mm-hmm. right? I mean, obviously the thing people talk about is the Czech New Wave, mm-hmm. Czech and Slovak mm-hmm. New Wave. Uh, what do you think of those films? I really like those films. To be honest, I haven't seen all of them. There sure. are quite a few of them, but I'm familiar with some of the classics, like Closely Watched Trains or The Fireman's Ball. Um, I mean, all of these guys, like Milos Forman and uh, Viera Hitilova, uh, a lot of these directors went to FAMU. Mm-hmm. And I know that a lot of them were trying to make something different, something that was kind of against the regime, exposing things, exposing certain behaviors, especially behavior of youth and things like this, rebellion. Yeah, I really like them. And I thought that they were very odd, some of them, but also very eye-opening. The Fireman's Ball was a film when I first saw it on a plane, actually. And I didn't like it that much, which is quite controversial to say, maybe, because, you know, that's really a classic. But it wasn't until I watched it again, maybe a year later, that I liked it much more. So I think, you know, sometimes when you watch a film and maybe you're not fully concentrated or something like that. So when I watched it later, I enjoyed it way more. And I was talking to some of my Czech friends who were saying, you know, some of these things are still like this, you know, the the corruption there's so much in there that still exists and after living here for a while i kind of got it it's very meta yeah in it many is ways, extremely you know? meta uh, it's so cool that none of them are actors too yeah. yeah that's amazing you you would not know watching at all yeah so i i do really like that film and i like quite a few films from that time but when i think of czech cinema generally my mind automatically goes to animation i love animation but i especially love stop animation mm-hmm. and i love if, if you see the program at Edison, I show quite a lot of weird films. So I, I'm a huge fan of weird, surrealist kind of films. So I love Schwankmeier, Jan Schwankmeier. Of course. He's amazing. Um, his version of Alice in Wonderland mm. is wonderful. And this uh, one film by Schwankmeier, Otisane, mm. Greedy Guts in English, is so twisted and so <laughs> weird. I remember the first scene of the film is a guy, typical Czech guy, uh, from a family looking out his window onto the street and it's around Christmas time so the carp are in the big tubs you know how they are which I'll never really get used to that but anyway Uh, and he's looking outside and all of the carps turn into babies like just floating around these puppet babies and they're fishing out babies with this net and giving them to people and I and the minute I thought that I thought okay this film is definitely for me this is some really really crazy shit so so I watched that and I I absolutely loved it and the stop animation uh, mix of you know having Otisanek the the baby made from wood a stop animation with live action film was just so cool he's a genius wild genius he is and he's got so many short films that you can watch online too that are also fantastic mm-hmm. so that was good faust was good karel zaman i have to talk about too who yeah of course i mm. mean they opened up the museum to him a few years ago yeah i've been meaning to go there for quite some time actually i might go this summer because i'm really looking forward to seeing it and some of those films are fantastic too again a lot of people don't realize that hollywood france a lot of the people who would end up doing special effects and even just the way that he put his films together they actually 
actually owe him a debt because mm-hmm. many of them got their ideas from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, including Terry Gilliam got a lot of his ideas from him. And Terry Gilliam is someone that's been uh, both to Prague and the Kalavivari Film Festival quite a few times. He loves it here. And he always talks about how Zaman was a big inspiration for him. And, and you can see it in Monty Python films with all of their stop motion weird mm-hmm. stuff, which is just hilarious. Looks a lot like Zaman stuff too, which yeah. is cool. What do you think of the modern Czech film industry? And by that, I mean Czech-made films. Because I think Czechs very, very often, they either like the really weird stuff like Schmeckmeyer, or they like stuff that really feels true somehow to them. So, you know, you're in a cinema, a preview comes up for the next Czech summer film, and it's, we say, oh, that's that, it's that Czech film again. It's the same movie over and over and over. Yeah. Three couples... Three different generations up in a cabin in the woods. The older couple are fighting. You know, somebody's mm-hmm. having an affair. It all becomes tearful. And then at the end, they sort of reset and they just continue with their way. And every Czech I know goes to see these movies and says, it was just so beautiful and so wonderful. And I always feel like a jerk <laughs> because when I see these movies, I go, I didn't find it that wonderful. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've seen this film 35 times already. Exactly. And I don't know what it is about this type of movie that yeah. appeals to you so much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you get people like young Sviarok, mm-hmm. who made, uh, like, obviously, Kolio won the Oscar, mm-hmm. and that's a very Czech movie. It is. Uh, Accumulator, I think a- that was. Accumulator is, is fantastic, hysterically mm, funny. Yeah. That's really good. Though it degenerates at the end into, what exactly mm. is happening? Yeah. <laughs> but I know I know Czechs who, when Bright Blue World came out, were like, ah, he's just trying to be like a Hollywood guy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like they, they reject that kind of aesthetic. Yeah. Czech films still have this kind of almost, I don't want to call it old fashioned, but a little bit old fashioned style of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. They do. And it was interesting when you said that there are, in modern day, these kind of two different types, either the really, really weird ones or the ones that are these these family kind of drama slash comedy things. And there's a lot of them. And I don't like these movies mm-hmm. at all, most of them. Sorry, and, sorry, Czech people. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I really do love a lot of Czech films, but I don't really like these these comedies that are pumped out of Mm -hmm. the industry here. You know, there's like several a month. And, you know, they all have the same poster, the the same actors. And, you know, some of them are fantastic actors. I have no doubt about that. But the story is always the same. It's always some kind of village comedy. And maybe I can't relate to it, but I don't think so. Because some of those original ones, for example, Slunce Seno, uh, which, you know, is played a hundred times a day on television here I still love because it does have a special kind of um, kind of village uh, comfort food vibe to it it's it's very nice yeah it's very charming and and it's quite funny too and quite ridiculous but I think they took that to the extreme now now it's a bit too much with they pump out way too many of these films and I don't like them but it it seems like it seems to me like the producers maybe have gotten in there and and they're playing it safe. Yeah. They know, look, we know that this film isn't going to play mm-hmm. outside of this country. Mm. So we need to make our money inside this country. Yeah. What do people like? Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. like films that are exactly like them and their friends. Yeah, exactly. So let's make that movie again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's horrible, but I understand why they get into this mess because they make money and people go and see them. So mm-hmm. of course they're going to keep making them. But I really want them to take more risks, a lot mm-hmm. more risks and make more um, just different genre films. I mean, in the past, we had these different genre films. We had some very weird, surreal films that we've already talked about, but they don't really exist anymore. I mean, I think for... those people leave. I think they go to FAMU, yeah, and then they, they, usually and then they go do. abroad. And yes, yeah. uh, Holland... Yeah, exactly. She's yeah. she's a big, big deal. Yeah. She's a FAMU graduate, and yeah. she was like, I'm out of here, Jack. Yeah. And now she's off making the big bucks. Yeah, know? yeah. I mean, is that exactly. is, is it just that the, the film market is constrained by its size, mm-hmm. maybe? Yeah, I think that has uh, a bit to do with it, yeah. But they they really put these um, these constraints on there, like you said. 
On the opposite end of the spectrum, the weird films, you know, it's, it's very hard for them to make these. But they do make a couple of them a year. And w when I say weird films, not just weird films, but just different films, let's say, different right. films. And, you know, they make them for Kalavivari, usually, or in the hope that they will go to some bigger festivals. And a really good example of that, a uh, very successful one recently, was The Painted Bird. Um, and that was a really interesting film. And I was actually on set for that film. Uh, really? With, yeah, with Václav Marhol. Uh, who is so nice, by the way. The whole film had a very interesting edge to it. It was brutal to watch, very disturbing, and also very long. I think it clocks in at almost three hours, mm. but beautifully filmed. And it's a very interesting Holocaust movie. Uh, I've never quite seen a Holocaust movie like that. And, you know, the Holocaust genre, if you want to call it a genre, they've done all sorts of things because there's so much you can talk about because it was such a horrible event, obviously, mm. that affected so so many people but there's something almost supernatural about the painted bird and it's very hellish and it really reminded me of hell it's a great film and i remember being on set for that and being blown away especially listening to uh vatslav uh to vatslav marhol the director talk about it because he was really really passionate about it mm. and i realized how hard it was to make a film like this here because it did take him so long and he pitched it so many times and it was a very very uh, painstaking get, uh, process did, did he get state funding yeah he did in the end but i think it took quite some time <laughs> right <laughs> like, to, like, to yeah, get I have, it i have a whole bunch of awesome scenes i'd like to show yeah you. yeah they don't make sense yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah it was so funny because that was uh one of my first times on quite a big film actually and I was there for the whole afternoon and it was pissing down with rain there was so much rain and these guys had been there this was towards the end of the filming actually I think this was the second last day of filming and you know everyone's covered in mud and the old clothes and you know it's supposed to look like that it's a scene where a village is getting raided by um, the uh, Cossacks mm. and one of them is Radim Fiala who is a Czech actor also very nice extremely funny guy on set and gave me a bunch of cigarettes so thank you for that <laughs> yeah that's currency in the yeah, war <laughs> exactly yeah it was it was really surreal but you know i was there all afternoon and then i actually saw the film quite late i don't remember why and then when i saw it i was in lucerna and i was so excited to see the scene that i knew that i was there for right and then it came on 10 seconds over it was literally like 10 fucking seconds of the village being burnt to the ground like people getting shot everything and like, that was yeah. hours <laughs> yeah yeah it was hours to hours film that 10 hours. seconds yeah, and I thought I knew a lot about filmmaking, you know, and then I saw that and I thought, whoa, okay, that's, yeah. Apparently that's, not. Yeah, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> we need more films like that, yeah. definitely, more risks. More risk-taking, yeah. please. Cause, because the truth of the matter is, there's a market now, we have the streaming services. Mm -hmm. Netflix seems to be positioning themselves to be sort of this international mm -hmm. clearinghouse, if you will, of... Yeah content mm -hmm. they pump out so much stuff they're grabbing so stuff much. from oh here's a bunch of stuff from turkey here's a bunch of stuff from india mm -hmm. here's a bunch of stuff from here from here korea this and this and people are watching them mm -hmm. and so i think that there is a market if people want to do things that maybe are a little off the beaten path and again keep in mind we're not saying that you have to make armageddon mm -hmm. which is a film every czech person i know just mocked mercilessly because they're like oh, really oh. yeah because because it's got this american trope true the world is the world mm. is in danger yeah and a handful of people mm -hmm. who are kind of good at what they do mm. but by god they've got stick to itiveness and they're gonna save the entire mm -hmm. world it's ridiculous checks mm. are like oh what are you kidding <laughs> Try, try getting occupied for, you know, centuries yeah. and then occupied again for <laughs> centuries and then occupied again for decades. Shut up, you Americans, honestly. <laughs> it's so funny that it's that film, though. I mean, that was a really famous film when it came out at the time, but there are lots of films like that. It's just it's funny which films become more famous in yeah, 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 other yeah, yeah. countries, I think. Cause... I literally had a conversation about it just the other day with somebody and they were like, oh, God, this is so stupid. I said, yeah, but the, but the action scenes, and they're like, action, who cares about action? I want to watch a bunch of people making bad coffee 
<laughs> and having a marital crisis. That's oh what I want to watch. Yeah. Because that's what my life is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want something I can relate to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Czech cinema has been very influential. It certainly had periods and ups and downs. A lot of quite famous people have come out of this scene. And with films like The Painted Bird, perhaps we see a direction for a more international audience for Czech sensibilities and Czech aesthetics. I mean, I live here. I like it here, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't mind if some of the ideas, because I know we're making fun of Czechs, sensibilities a little bit, but... Czechs are incredibly humanist, and I wouldn't mind seeing more of that Mm -hmm. filter out there into the cinema sphere. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if I can watch another true crime thing, (laughs) you know. I don't know if I can watch another cynical thing. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, the, the Czech filmmaking style and the content that they choose to highlight is... Maybe it's an antidote to cynicism. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe. All I know is that there are a lot of talented filmmakers here, a lot of young, talented filmmakers uh, whom I've met that could make incredible films if given the chance. Well, here's hoping. Well, I would like to thank Ryan Keating, no Lambert, (laughs) for talking to me today. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you very much, Derek DeWitt. And Derek DeWitt, it's... Your name sounds so familiar, and I think that's because it's D&D, and it reminds me of, like, Donnie Darko or Clark Kent, or yes, it's wow. very superhero-y, there's, so that's There's a lot that's of cool. alliteration. Yeah, yeah, yeah people yeah, are yeah. going to remember that. But thank you for having me. It's, exactly. it's great. Absolutely. Maybe we'll have you on again. And <laughs> Excellent. thank everybody for listening. Make sure to check the description of the podcast for links to Movie Barf, Edison Film Hub, and other things and places that were mentioned in this episode of Prog Times. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prog Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prog Times. <laughs>